Okay, um, this second panel uh, is on lessons from the past and policy issues for the new administration. I'm always glad to hear about lessons from the past. Being a historian uh, myself, not enough people talk about the past and its relevance uh, for the future. And I want to just take a, a couple of seconds uh, before I introduce our panelists to say um, just a quick word about lessons of the past. And it seems to me uh, the most important one that we've seen is that democracy in Taiwan works. Um, I think if you look back at some past elections we've had, everybody was terribly worried. Would um, people uh, behave themselves? Would they accept the results? Would somebody in power stay in power even if he didn't win? You didn't hear any of that kind of thing. I think everybody expects Taiwan elections now to work smoothly, and they do. Uh, which I think is encouraging uh, and exciting uh, for us all. I, I think there were some, uh, just a couple of other things came to mind in terms of lessons of the past. Um, I think that China was extraordinarily quiet. It did try to coerce people, but in a far more uh, civilized fashion than in the past. There wasn't a lot of fire and brimstone around. Uh, and so um, I think we did see change. And, and uh, historians don't forecast, but I would forecast um, that China, having learned that their candidate can win even if they're not threatening, may do that on into the future. Um, I think we also um, saw, um, I think Taiwan will not have the problem uh, of leadership transitions, uh, but as we uh, look at what the policies of this administration may be in its second term, we must not forget uh, that there will be leadership transitions around the region, uh, and that 2012 may well be um, a period of um, great caution. Um, Chinese leaders don't like to do much before party congresses, uh, and um, even perhaps uh, paralysis, but we are going to see elections in uh, South Korea, a sort of election in, in Hong Kong, uh, Japan's governments rise and fall quickly, and of course we're going to have um, an election here, so it will continue to be uh, a challenging year, um, but perhaps one in which everybody can step back uh, and uh, look at the stabilization of relations. And along those lines, it seemed to me that the new administration in Taiwan um, does need, as some people uh, were suggesting in the last panel, and I'm sure my colleagues will uh, hear, um, to reach out to those that didn't vote blue, uh, and particularly on economic issues, to do something about um, economic reform, the wealth gap, and some of the social justice issues which didn't turn the election, uh, but nevertheless are terribly important, um, that there's also um, a, a critical issue of saying clearly to China uh, that expectations for what is going to happen in a second Ma uh, administration and cross-race relations shouldn't be uh, too high, that China did not win the election for Ma Yingzhou, that lots of other things were going on. Uh, and then as far as the United States goes, I think there's going to have to be a real active effort um, to prolong uh, the kind of uh, gains that Taiwan made in the run-up to the election, that just because the election season is now over uh, doesn't mean uh, that the United States should not follow through and indeed add to things like visa waiver and high-level visits. There are TIFA talks and other things um, that need to be done. And once the attention of the election uh, fades, um, I hope that the administration will not fade uh, along with it and go back to um, a distant relationship uh, with Taipei. Uh, okay, having uh, done my editorial uh, comments, uh, I want to go ahead and uh, introduce briefly uh, our uh, very prestigious uh, panel. Uh, we have uh, three um, uh, very important people and interesting people to hear. Uh, first of all, uh, David Wong, uh, who uh, is an associate research fellow of the Institute of European and American Studies at Academia Sinica, an adjunct associate professor in the Graduate Institute of National Development uh, at National Taiwan University. His current research focuses on electoral studies, U.S. and European politics, and 
comparative regionalism, and many of us in the room know him from the time that he spent on the Mainland Affairs Council and with TECRO uh, here in Washington. Uh, Gao Subo uh, is currently the executive director of the 21st Century Foundation, a leading policy think tank in Taiwan. Uh, he served in the administration of President Ma ying Zhou as a minister without portfolio in charge of legal affairs, served in the Taiwan uh, Legislative Yuan, uh, and is a faculty member at Shershin University Law School. Uh, so uh, he's going to be our legal um, uh, advisor, perhaps. Uh, and uh, finally, but not least, of course, uh, Douglas Paul, Vice President for Studies at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And of course, again, as we most know him, um, as um, uh, d Director of the American Institute in Taiwan, uh, in Taiwan, uh, previously on the National Security Council staffs of the Reagan and Bush uh, Bush H.W. Uh, administration and director, uh, and there he was, director of Asian Affairs and then senior director and special assistant uh, to the president. Um, why don't we go ahead? Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Tucker's kind introductions. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is David Huang. I uh, would like to first thank the, uh, Dr. Richard Bush of the Brookings and the Dr. Bonnie Gressers of the CSIS for a kind invitation to allow me to share my uh, idea and some uh, view about the 2012 election in Taiwan. Um, I heard something about the uh, Taiwan election result from uh, uh, Professor Zhu. Uh, I think uh, he already uh, steals some of my lines in the, in the following <laughs> representations. So I've been uh, pretty uh, timid to present my, uh, uh, my view, but in any case, I will skip uh, the highlights of election result <laughs> and go into directly to the interpretations. So one quick point about the turnout. I think it is generally agreed that the 2012 presidential elections is vest with the uh, negative campaign, which leave no rooms for policy, policy debate. For example, Ma accused Tsai on Yu Chang tech, general tech case, Chen Shui-bian scandals, whereas Tsai accused Ma met a local gangster to fix elections and his improper acceptance of illegal donations of a big corporations. Such negative campaigns tend to depress the turnout. And I think according to voting behavior, this is the case. And uh, this may explain why turnout rate is the lowest one, even though the election is considered to be the very close, which should promote the turnout. Moreover, negative campaigns are more likely to depress turnout of the young voters, first-time voters, and those who do not have strong party IDs. And you know that these, these voters tend to be more or less in favor of the, uh, the DPP. And given that the number of KMT supporters is larger than the DPP, then selectively depressing the turnout would work for the KMT. Another popular interpretation of the 2012 elections regarded as a referendum of 1992 consensus, for example, United Daily editorial in the, uh, I think, the next day of the elections, it said that uh, the victory, this is uh, the election is the victory of ele economic voters and endorsement of 1992 consensus. I think there are good reason to resist such interpretations. Presidential elections always won and lost by many factors, including the party trends, candidate qualities, campaign dynamics, and policy stances. I think Professor Zhu just mentioned a lot of the factors that would influence uh, the election result. Voters vote for Ma and Tsai for various reasons. The perception of 99 consensus may be the only one of them, but poll after poll show that more than 60% of the Taiwanese people do not know what, the, what is the content of 99 consensus. The debate over it simply confused voters' perception on it. Most people take it as a cue, as a cue for the stability across the Taiwan Strait, and some refused to hear the debate and did not vote at all. Therefore, it would be more accurate to say that Ma's win is an endorsement of cross-strait stabilities, whereas Tsai failed to convince the people that she can. But here, Beijing serves as a veto player, in the sense that whatever Tsai proposed needs Beijing's approval at least consent. If you still insist that, you know, I know audience may still think that the mass win is the endorsement of 99 consensus, then take this. One can argue that such endorsement is in fact in decline since 2008. 
given that 1.4 million less of Taiwanese people vote for Mao in 2012. Moreover, despite in the campaign, DPP tried to dodge the issues of 1990 consensus, adopt a moderate concept of the Taiwan consensus, declare Taiwan is ROC. Still, Taiwan Solidarity Union, TSU, which campaigned against ECFA, against Ma, against 1990 consensus, managed to win 9% of the votes. And such vote for the party list carry a clear message for part policy, policy preference, which will be duly noted by Beijing. Okay? If the so-called peace bonus as a result of the 1990 consensus continue not to trickle down to the average Taiwanese people, then it would not be surprised that 1990 consensus be rejected in the future Taiwan, Taiwan elections. In other words, among Taiwanese people, the term 1990 consensus serves only with instrumental values, which is tied up with the promise of stabilities and delivery of economic benefits. Can 2012 election be explained by economic voting? I think it can. To some extent, it can. But unlike the electoral behavior in Western democracy, where we usually find it to be a social tropical, and retrospective voting, the Taiwanese voting voters seem to embrace the pocket vote, pocketbook and the prospective voting in 2012. Even though people does not feel national economy is in a good shape, and maybe people feel that mass performance, performance is not up to their expectations, people still vote for continuities and more certain futures against the change and uncertain future of the Chinese government. So Tsai's campaign on mass incompetence and his records of economic inequalities, hoping that the test of a Ma would win her the presidencies. However, during a period of great uncertainties in economic downturns, people may feel that she does not provide convincing policies that would eliminate uncertain futures. If the above analysis is correct, then Tsai could well be defeated simply by the uncertain nature of any challenges. Given that the 2012 elections, Taiwanese voters are prospective and pocket but pocketbook oriented, it would not be surprised that money pulled the strings. So you see that you have the one party, the KMT, with a massive amount of uh, party asset. The, and then you have the party with no party asset, rely on the you know, piggy banks, small amount donations, raise only 200 million NT dollars, whereas KMT last year reported to the, uh, uh, to the, by the media that the stock market operations uh, make uh, the KMT th through the uh, stock market operations, they earn, they earn the two, uh, three, uh, 2.9 billion NT dollars. So you see that there's a lot of uh, differences. Of course, that KMT is incumbent. They have always uh, administrative uh, resources to, uh, to devote in, in, in the uh, elections. But you know, it's, this, is, this, this is not an excuse to say, it's just one to keep, it's not an excuse for the DPP defeat, it's just one to uh, put you in the, into some perspectives. Elections itself, you have di uh, differential resources. And then, this is actually also shows that Beijing's influence successfully penetrate into the KMT's local party machines. For example, uh, Hualien County Magistrate uh, uh, Fu, Kun, uh, uh, Fu Kunqi. Fu Kunqi, I believe he's no friend of uh, President Ma. He is a very close ally to uh, James Song. But in the end, he come up to uh, support the uh, mass campaign. It's because that he, according to him, is that because Beijing said that the, the Chinese tourists is uh, critical uh, for, Chinese tour tourists are critical for uh, Hualien's economies. So I think Beijing's influence is subtly influences. Even though Professor Tucker just said that uh, Beijing leadership did not you know, articulate or use a very uh, strong uh, rhetoric uh, or threat against Taiwanese voters. But you know, the subtle operations seem to, seem to work pretty well. Again, that you will see that the, uh, uh, the CEOs of the big corporations in Taiwan endorse Ma publicly. But I think that if you uh, read uh, uh, their message carefully, I think that most of the uh, big corporation CEOs seem to say that they endorse 992 consensus try to refrain from endorsing particular candidates. I think this is following the trend of the, uh, uh, the businessmen don't like to endorse either, either side. They would like to you know, be more neutral. But then this time, uh, I th obviously, the endorsement of the 1990 uh, uh, consensus is very important for them to show the flex to Beijing and then make, them, make, make their business in, in, in China a lot easier to do. Okay, so this is uh, generally an interpretation of the election result. Then. If you think that in this way, the, this campaign is more about you know, economics, 
And I think in, in the future, Professor Zhu just said, the um, per, um, Mars administration will be uh, occupied, preoccupied with all kinds of economic issues in Taiwan. But if you, if you uh, compare the 10-year the party plan of the DPP and the uh, golden 10-year and national prospect, uh, na national prospect of the KMTs, there are a lot of similarities. Our economics, on social issues, on agriculture, and environmental, and regional policies, there are a lot of similarities between Mars and Tsai's campaign pledges, which should be sorted out as Mars policy priorities. For example, FTA with trade partners, both DPP and KMT agree, we should have a more FTAs without major trade partners. Fair taxation, also mentioned in the uh, Mars uh, campaign pledge, as well as that. Uh, Size campaign pledge, affordable housing, income equality, structural reform, SME assistance, uh, promote green technology, industrial innovations, regional balance, food security mechanism. In fact, all these issues are mentioned. If you compare Mars and size campaign pledges, it's exactly the same. So I think, in fact, this is not a bad idea. I would suggest that, in fact, the trial of DPP policy, uh, a trial of a DPP policy, simply does not ne necessarily show the weakness of the KMT. Rather, it would enhance the cross-party cooperations after the elections. New administration should also promote more liberalized regime for business with Taiwan. That is to eliminate red taps regulating multinational corporations to do business and foreign expatriate to stay in Taiwan. Unilateral deregulations is one way to encourage FDIs. Mars administration may need to speed up the negotiation over the FTA with major trade partner. Currently, we, I think everybody knows that in this room that uh, we have some progress uh, with the negotiation uh, uh, on FTA with, uh, with Singapore. But you know, major trade partner like Japan, United States, and maybe EU should be our own focus because the Korea already signed an FTA with, uh, uh, with, with, with the United States and the EU. So I think it's very important for Taiwan to do so as well. It should be declared willingness to engage TPP negotiation immediately rather than waiting for or preparing for 10 years to join. I think the United States government is very, very amb ambitious to um, take the leaderships over the uh, TPP negotiations. I believe that uh, by the 2012, this year, by the end of 2012, there will be some, uh, some format or agreement of the TPP uh, between the uh, United States and, and other eight uh, partners, trade partners. So, so Taiwan should, should try to uh, engage TPP in negotiation as soon as possible, rather than uh, you, uh, preparing it for 10 years. One way to show the Taiwan's determination to negotiate TPP is to follow Japan examples. So by, show, by, sh by showing the intention to resolve the beef disputes with the United States, TFAR talks between the TFAR talks between the US and Taiwan can also include the content of TPP, potential content of the TPP's format, currently under negotiations among the P9s. There's another uh, important uh, idea in the Mars campaigns, free, econo uh, free economic demonstration zone is a, a, in a good start to promote regional liberalization, you know, liberalization among specific regions in Taiwan. But it should not be used as a substitute for Taiwan's global strategy. Trade diversification remains a priority. Mars should waste no time to implement a structural reform by promoting balance between the manufacturers and service sector. That's also in, in the uh, Mars uh, uh, campaign pledges. For example, promote high-tech, value-added, uh, high-value-added uh, traditional industries, strengthen R&D, enhance IPR protections, and most importantly, create a tougher region to punish illegal te technology transfer from Taiwan to elsewhere. Mars need to reconcile his promise to raise the basic level of wages and shorten the weekly working hours with his promise to encourage private investment and uh, FDIs. Uh, during the economic downturns, of course, Ma promised to establish a much better social safety net for poor people and those unemployed. But at the same time, he also pledged to uh, improve income equality by reforming taxation system. But the above policy are also likely to increase tax and spendings, which could potentially increase national debt and uh, tax burdens. If Ma is sincere to deliver this kind of promise, he should work closely with DPP and other opposition parties. In short, Mars policy should be domestic driven and soft. Domestic driven and soft. Though some solutions may require extend, uh, external help, but Mars could wrongly consider domestic, especially economic problem, can only be solved by external policies. If that is the case, then China, as usual, could be considered as the savior of Taiwan's economic by Mars. And cross economic gains may well be Mars' top concerns. And this concern 
would inevitably force Ma to make concessions with China in other policy areas, such as social culture framework agreements. This topic will be discussed in the next panels. On policies that KMT and DPP diverge, perhaps Ma should consult the opposition first before implementing it after all. DPP still retain 46% of the vote shares. Even though KMT has the majority in the LOI and the presidencies, KMT can push its own policies single-handedly, but the social cost will be very high. For example, it is about time to consolidate and refine cross-trade policies. Rather than venturing into new policy territories, raise expectation among the peoples without delivering it and trickle down the benefits to the average Taiwanese people. That would be a disaster for Ma, again for Ma. Energy policy regarding nuclear power should be more transparent debated in Taiwan. For DPP, I think that it needs to develop a set of coherent policy platform, which would mitigate Taiwan's voters' anxiety of the uncertain futures. It needs to focus on LOI and play as an effective opposition parties. With 40 MPs in the LOI and DPP party caucus can initiate its own, its own legislations as well as scrutiny and monitor the legislation in a constructive way. DPP should ensure the KMT policy are properly debated in the civil society and hold KMT responsible for any abuse of human rights. Thank you. First, thank you, Professor Tucker and uh, my uh, colleagues, panelists. Uh, I'm very uh, glad and uh, actually it's, uh, uh, I'm, it's my pleasure uh, to be here. And I want to thank you, uh, Dr. Richard Bush and uh, Bonnie uh, to bring me here uh, in Washington uh, just before the Chinese New Year. I think, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, first I want to echo that uh, Professor Tucker just uh, mentioned uh, in her uh, introductory remarks uh, that uh, for the people and uh, I should say friends uh, concerned and care about Taiwan here, uh, we should first report to you that the democracy in Taiwan works again. And the legitimacy of the election process and of the result uh, of people's choice are well accepted. Uh, it is on this solid basis that uh, we can look forward for the future uh, policy challenges uh, for the new administrations. I think uh, before I left for Washington, uh, my affiliate institute, uh, that is the 21st Century Foundation, uh, we host a, a lunch for uh, a, a group of international delegates uh, who came to observe the elections in Taiwan. And uh, actually, uh, the, uh, the, that group of delegates include uh, our panelists and uh, uh, the moderator of the, of the first panel. And uh, according to actually their observation, and I think all uh, you can hear up to now, uh, many of our panelists, uh, they have a different idea about uh, the reasons for winning and losing. Uh, of uh, the, 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 the election, but uh, they agree on one thing, and actually that also uh, echoes many of the commentaries of uh, domestic or international uh, medias. That is, uh, uh, it's a clear win for Ma uh, uh, by his uh, stability and the predictable, predictability approach over uncertainty. Uh, that's the, I think, uh, a consensus that uh, uh, no matter what's the interpretation of uh, uh, the winning and losing reasons uh, of the election, but uh, it seems that uh, most of people uh, tend to agree and conquer on this uh, reason uh, behind uh, various other things. Uh, that is, uh, this is a stability approach and wins over uh, uncertainty. And I think in other words, there are, um, I mean, our topic, or the title of this panel, it's a lesson from the past and uh, uh, the, the, the challenge, the policy 
uh, implication for the future. I think, in other words, uh, I don't uh, want to explore more about uh, the, the election itself, but uh, I want to put more emphasis on that, uh, uh, according to this, uh, uh, the, the topic and uh, the stability and predictability approach. Uh, I think there are destabilizing factors that we can recognize from the past experience, and therefore we need to uh, deal with those destabilizing factors. And this is uh, actually my understanding of the title of uh, this panel. And I will uh, try to point out two issues that I think will be most destabilizing factors in the future, and which also happen to clearly follow the battle lines of the blue and the green camps in the, uh, in the campaign. Uh, I will say uh, two major uh, destabilizing factors uh, and as two issues. I think the first uh, uh, issues, uh, I should uh, call it a distribution issues or the issue of the imbalance of regional development. And this is, uh, I think, um, uh, uh, most of uh, uh, friends here uh, are well aware of uh, that's the, the byproducts of the globalization. And the second uh, destabilizing factors that I want to mention about, uh, actually, I think it's uh, the approach of the open up society, uh, the approach of uh, 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 the issue of op the open up society, and certainly it's an open up Taiwanese society toward mainland China. Uh, this is the second uh, issue I want to uh, talk about. I think uh, 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 return to the first one that. Uh, uh, the distribution issue, or the, uh, in other words, the imbalance of the regional development. Uh, some economists actually have argued uh, that the worldwide phenomena of uh, distribution inequality as a byproduct of the globalization. That is the famous uh, saying uh, after the occupying Wall Street uh, movement, uh, that the 1%, the, the, the famous sunbuy, that the 1% versus the 99%. Uh, this uh, uh, distribution equality actually has a very uh, stunning parallel phenomena of imbalance of regional development, I mean, in Taiwan. At the, uh, one famous economist uh, advanced uh, this theory. It's uh, actually uh, Professor uh, Zhu Yinhan's brother. That is Professor Zhu Yinpeng. And According to this, uh, his theory, he said, down till the central part of Taiwan, actually the Taichung, Zhanghua, and Nantou areas are included within the radius of the globalization force and are by and large benefited by this process. But the southern part, that means uh, Yunjianan and the Gaoping, or Gao Gaoping, the southern part is generally left out and the suffer in this process. Though, although this actually is a phenomena, it's a worldwide phenomena, it's a global phenomena, and the byproduct of the globalization. But uh, in Taiwan, it is coupling with uh, uh, another things that make uh, this very uh, serious and very difficult to deal with. That is, in Taiwan, when we talk about globalization, actually, in uh, a large, to a very large extent, we actually are talking about a further economic integration with mainland China. So uh, this uh, coupling with the phenomena of uh, 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 distribution issues becomes uh, very difficult to deal with, uh, in, uh, especially in Taiwan, because uh, it turns it into a highly political or ideological issue. So uh, this is the, the first thing. I think after this election, actually, uh, uh, the, the Ma administration need to deal with this situation. And I think this is a, a, a well-argued uh, uh, issues uh, during the whole campaign. And uh, uh, we should say that actually uh, DPP to some extent 
successfully raise up these issues and put it into a political agenda. So this is the issues, low, uh, uh, relatively domestic one. But I think this is the issues that in the um, uh, new administrations uh, that President Ma need to be uh, to deal with it uh, uh, in a very uh, technical way, uh, you know, and, and in a very sophisticated way. This is uh, uh, the first thing that uh, I would like to to share with uh, uh, our audience. That is the first uh, issue that uh, we need to face uh, in a new administration. And let me turn up, turn to the, the second one. Um, the second issue that uh, uh, actually I I call it uh, the issue of uh, open up society. Uh, that's this the second uh, destabilizing factors. Uh, we call it the issue of open up Taiwanese society toward men and China. Uh, there are a lot of examples to demonstrate the difference between uh, the blue camp and the green camp on these issues. For example, whether open up the higher education system toward the students from mainland China in a more in a, a larger scale, is it a good thing or a bad thing? Whether it is, uh, uh, you know, a platform uh, for building up a common empathy, or like uh, other uh, people, uh, some friends in a green camp, they argue it will be a story of joy. I think uh, you, uh, everyone here understand uh, the analogy, huh? the, the, the story of joy. So uh, this is one example. And another ex example is, uh, for example, like uh, uh, foreign direct investment. Uh, does the foreign direct investment in the high tech sector say, let's say uh, whether Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company build up a high tech, a high end capacity in mainland? Or the other, uh, the other very similar example, the incoming capital uh, from mainland investing into the Taiwan's infrastructure, let's say, like telecom. Is it a good thing or a bad thing? Is this a chance for a bond for common interest or a weakness will result in from dependence? This is all arguable. This is arguable. But uh, I shall very sincerely report to you that in general, I do believe that the open up approach is beneficial to both sides in terms of uh, real interest as well as common empathy. Uh, this is uh, actually an experiment uh, the mass administration uh, implement uh, in the past few years, although in a not a very big scale. But it tries to move forward to open up Taiwan society to mainland China. And uh, I think the good effect of this approach will gradually uh, uh, flourish and appear uh, to m many sectors of the society. But there is a real, uh, I think a real challenge, a real dilemma for this open up approach. I think after this election, we already hear that uh, some of our friends, uh, uh, domestic or uh, inside in Taiwan or abroad, that uh, uh, they begin to argue that the ultimate trump card of the open up approach is the inspiration and potential pressure of Taiwan's democracy upon men in China, authoritarian rule. I really believe that democracy is more desirable and a democracy is safer neighboring another democracy. Especially uh, this neighbor is huge. So, uh, but this also means that Taiwan's democracy is potentially challenged to the nature of the authoritarian rule in mainland China. And this in turn indicates two things. The first, Taiwan's democracy is attractive so long as it is a unique achievement among Chinese society. The emphasis here, the emphasis here is on Chinese and this means that the 90 Ku consensus based on the ROC constitution, it's a very useful uh, tool. 
And the second thing, the, the second indication is the short term real interest, which is dependent on the, 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 the goodwill, uh, party dependent on goodwill of mainland authority, may conflict with the long term strategic interest, which is potentially challenge to the legitimacy of the mainland authority. So this means uh, when we want to talk about the, the, the democracy inspiration from Taiwan, actually this will put the, uh, Taiwan in a, in a dilemma that uh, I think they will need to be addressed uh, in this, maybe in the second term we have a chance to address it. That is, uh, we need a synthetic strategy that can balance this short-term uh, 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 real interest and against this long-term strategic interest. I think this is uh, uh, the conclusion that I think uh, we want to keep this going for a longer period of time. We need to deal with the two issues that I just mentioned about. The first is the distribution issues, and the second is this uh, synthetic strategy between the short-term real interest and the long-term strategic interest. And this concludes my pre uh, uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Well, good morning, everyone. I, I want to um, start by expressing my thanks to uh, Richard Bush and Bonnie Glazer and Brookings and CSIS for organizing this event. You've brought together, at a time of high interest, a really uh, impressive group of people from the Washington area as well as uh, across from Taiwan and the mainland. Uh, a lot has been said this morning about the election. I want to uh, subscribe entirely to the very fine remarks of our good friend Zhu Yun Han's uh, presentation on what has been observable about the election over the last uh, few weeks and the conclusions he's drawn. And, uh, but more importantly, I want to, in a personal capacity, express my uh, heartfelt congratulations to the people of Taiwan for a very uh, successfully conducted election campaign and election outcome. The, um, if you look back, I mean, most of you have a good memory. If you look back a few years, we've had some pretty contentious elections and pretty uh, unhappy outcomes in the view of many voters in Taiwan over the two bullets and what consequences they may or may not have had in 2004. Um, the, uh, many people in 2008 at the DPP camp thought it would be the end of their party if they were defeated in that election, and they were heavily defeated. And yet here we are just having a very vibrant campaign with a multi-party system and a DPP that had really res resuscitated itself impressively. Um, the observations on the street when you saw the election taking place this last weekend were entirely of a different kind. It was a quiet, a calm, an acceptance, and a participation level that really, uh, I think, is uh, world-class and really impressive and deserves full uh, congratulations. The election marks the first uh, of the important thresholds of 2012 that we're going to have to cross electorally. Uh, we've got elections coming up through the year, as has been mentioned earlier in the previous panel, in uh, Korea, Malaysia, Russia, a kind of election in China or a selection process in China, and our own election, which is going to distract us more and more as the year goes on. Um, I'm, not of the, I'm not of the school that... Uh, the election of Miss Tsai Ing-wen would have somehow put us in a perilous position. But I do think the message of stability and continuity is one that can be welcomed by Taiwan's neighbors and by the United States. Uh, one of the important outcomes of after the election, and it was uh, referenced in the earlier panel, was that uh, indirectly referenced President Ma has offered in the uh, years of his four years term ahead to meet every six months or so with the opposition. Now, I'm sure between now and the first such meeting, there'll be all kinds of ups and downs politically. But I think the gesture is, is an appropriate one. When the election result is good for the, the winner, but not overwhelming, 
And when the issues that Taiwan faces are of the nature that they are, that kind of consultative mechanism will be really important to sustaining public support for the challenges that Taiwan faces. Well, one, among the challenges they face are the two parties. Um, we've just had speakers who represent youth in both wings of the KMT and uh, DPP relative to the leadership generally. Um, the KMT is long on experience and short on youth, if you look at it from a distance. Uh, they seem to know that deep, the KMT headquarters was full of young people who were uh, getting involved in the process. There are lots of 20-somethings and 30-somethings, which augurs well for their future. The DPP, by contrast, has always been long on youth and short on experience, and they're going to be short of experience for another few years. But I think they have been very conscientiously trying to develop talent that can put themselves forward in the coming elections, because we will be leaving behind a, a, a very veteran generation going into the next four years and cultivating new talent on, in both parties, uh, not to mention if TSU and, uh, and PFP find some way to reinvigorate themselves, uh, will be an important challenge in, as an issue going forward. Um, much of the foreign interest has, in Taiwan's election has focused on the cross-strait implications, as you all know. Uh, I was sort of distressed to see that a number of media outlets um, to include Lara Newshour last night, referred to Mr. Ma as the pro-China candidate. I th shorthand is inevitable in, in journalism, but that's a little bit too short. I think uh, Mr. Ma has a different view about China, but it doesn't make him pro-China. And uh, I don't think you would say the same thing about Dr. Tsai being anti-China. I think we need to raise the level of our discourse a little bit, even when we're trying to be concise and quick. The um, they, they, they do, however, uh, the new Ma administration and their uh, counterparts they have to work with in the legislative yuan uh, face a lot of issues in the cross-strait area. Um, Mr. Ma kept his agenda uh, modest for the future, and I think it remains modest in the aftermath of the election. He knows that uh, from all that he's said and done, you, you can sense that he knows there's a constraint on how far he can go with the public. He made it clear with his statement about uh, the possibility of political dialogue with the mainland, that it would be beyond his term in office that any kind of agreement could be reached, uh, and that Taiwan is not ready for it. And, then, and when that time comes, in his view, he stated that Taiwan would need both legislative action and a referendum to support any kind of political agreement with the mainland. So I think um, the, 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 it's not going to be where the political dialogue is that focuses attention for the next four years. It's going to be on cross-strait economic and cultural issues. There is a full agenda that gets down to, into the weeds very quickly, some of these issues, but they're very important to Taiwan's economic uh, future and to the stability of, the, of their obviously um, ambiguous, complex relationship with the mainland and with their neighbors. Uh, one of the big challenges that Taiwan faces as it tries to deal with economics and the mainland is that the outlook for economic growth and export markets worldwide is clouded by the, uh, the future of the European Union's internal financial problems. Uh, that's been a big market for Chinese product and Taiwan product to China and then onward to the European market. And the, I say that I'm on the gloomy side of the forecasters uh, on the outlook for Europe being able to provide a lot of growth uh, to help Taiwan deal with its domestic economic challenges that have been outlined in the campaign and in this morning about inequality and you know, income gap and uh, joblessness and low incomes for students starting out trying to find jobs. Uh, I would add to that that I have my own doubts about the PRC's own economic future over the, the medium to longer term. They have to make a transition which Japan uh, made in a way from the 80s to the 90s when they went from a very high availability of low cost or free investment capacity, capital, to having to rely more on consumption-led economy. China knows it has to move in that direction. It's found it difficult to make that step to consumption-driven econ economics, but that's uh, in the future. And that will change the way Taiwan producers and uh, whether the agricultural or industrial uh, relate to the mainland and the, and the more distant markets.
there's also, um, as, as was referenced earlier uh, by Dr. Gao, a uh, need to address the framework and the, the modalities within which Taiwan will expand its educational and cultural exchanges with the mainland. The uh, current number is something like 1,000 officially registered students and 10,000 informal students from the mainland. Uh, for very, the 10,000 being in Taiwan for short durations and informal programs. Um, that obviously has a great capacity to grow, but it'll be of social sensitivity. Anybody who's read the reports here about how Chinese students are taking places in American public universities that local Asian Americans think they have a right to can understand that in a Taiwan environment with the cross strait weight feeling so heavily that it would be a sensitive political issue and require quite a bit of internal consultation before outcomes can be arrived at. There, there's a, a long list of issues that um, will be uh, on the agenda for U.S. relations with Taiwan. The, the administration in the last months of the campaign sent over uh, some representatives of the U.S. Trade Representative's Office, USAID, and the Energy Department. And in each case, uh, the conversation sort of bumped up against the need to get on with the Trade and Investment Framework Agreement as a step toward ultimately a higher level of trade integration between the U.S. and, and Taiwan, and greater integration of Taiwan into the regional economic uh, liberalization that's taking place leading up to trade trans-Pacific partnership participation by many neighbors and perhaps even by Taiwan in a decade or so. The, uh, and to get to that trade and investment framework agreement, we got a couple of immediate problems. The first of which, of course, is the well-known one of beef, which was the doors on beef trade have been opened and shot and opened and shot and they're shut right now. Now that Mr. Ma has this election behind him, he doesn't have to cater to quite so many interests. Uh, one would hope that he would be able to have a freer hand to try to lead Taiwan and its political system toward accepting the resumption of uh, a much more liberal trade in beef and with that dealing with the ractopamine issue and the trade in pork. If we can get those out of the way, Atifa, uh, the doors to Atifa will come, I believe, wide open. The, um, addressing the internal imbalances in Taiwan is, is a huge uh, uh, challenge. How uh, you as I think it was Professor Gao said, this is a phenomenon of global characterization, of global character produced by the, the politics and economics of globalization, the byproduct of globalization. Uh, we're having the same problem in this country, as you, many, many of you know, CEO salaries as their companies go global, keep rising, but the pressure on the local employees uh, keeps their incomes down and their, and their um, benefits limited. And that's not just the U.S. It's just about anybody who's involved in global trade. Um, and if you're, of course, an, an entry into globalization, you're a new participant, you see the benefits, and you're not likely to want to change your behavior to accommodate people who've been benefiting from this system for a long time. So the different starting points for those who have to negotiate outcomes uh, that are more equitable for both sides. The demographics are a, a, an issue that has been touched upon as well. Um, I don't think there's much Taiwan can do about that. I mean, you, you can create a number of incentives to help people uh, make a decision to have more children. But as Singapore has shown over and over again, no matter how many schemes you come up with, people seem to want one child when they live in small apartments and have two working uh, parents and having more children is a burden because of the cost of education and the like. I, I would expect Taiwan would attempt to address the costs of education, improve the adequacy of housing, and try to get the income levels up for people who are entering into the workforce. They have been falling and it's a concern. But Taiwan also has to watch out not to let this attention to demographics and economic inequality hurt competitiveness in the long run. That's a tough balance to strike. Um, those are, those are the uh, major issues as I see them. Obviously, Taiwan also has, an, as a final point, Taiwan has a lot of space to occupy in the international world. The um, uh, International Civil Aviation Organization, the UN Framework on Climate Change, um, and I would add 
uh, Taiwan participation in international financial swap mechanisms that are already taking place in East Asia, uh, if that can be arranged in a way that uh, deals with the question of unofficiality, I think would be very beneficial as we look at a three to five year time horizon with potential financial crises uh, awaiting. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, the floor, <clears throat> excuse me, the floor is now open for questions. As you have seen, there is a roving mic, so please wait for that. Please identify yourself, and please don't make any speeches, because we don't have much time, and we want a lot of questions. I'll start over in the back there. Thank you. Uh, Dong Hui Yu with the China Review News Agency. My question is for Mr. Paul. Uh, the DPP seems to be very angry with uh, what you were talking about in Taiwan before the election. Would you like to clarify your position that you were not interfering in the Taiwan's election, <laughs> but uh, the stability across the Taiwan Strait is, uh, is beneficial for everyone in this uh, region. Thank you very much. Does anybody want to take this question? There? <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the very end of your question, that Taiwan something is beneficial to the region. What was that? Oh, cross it, okay. Well, um, when I got to Taiwan, uh, shortly after getting off the plane, an old friend asked if he could interview me and asked me a few questions that had been asked uh, repeatedly over the last five months. And I answered them in the same way I've been answering them for five months and have written in several articles, all of which are on the website at Carnegie Endowment if you want to have a reference to them. It just happened that According to some people who've talked to me afterwards, they felt that we had a, a down news cycle at that point, and uh, there was, the candidates weren't saying anything new, there were no new polls, and so something I said that was old got to be the news. Uh, it was never intended, it was said in a private, uh, you know, not in a public setting, not in a speech, it was with a, a, a standard um, media interview, but it got played up in ways that were quite unanticipated. Uh, Joe Bosco, National Security uh, Consultant. Uh, may I ask a question of the moderator? Nancy, you made the point that uh, uh, you thought it would be advisable for the administration to <coughs> continue the high-level uh, visits and contacts that it initiated during the campaign. And I wonder if you would envision that going as far as uh, Secretary Clinton attending the inaugural of uh, President Ma. Uh, and a question for, uh, for Doug. You uh, thought that uh, Ma would not uh, emphasize the political integration issues with, uh, with China during the second term. But will that be acceptable to Beijing? After all, the anti-secession law talks about exhausting the possibilities of peaceful unification. There couldn't be a more opportune time for that scenario than a Ma second term. And he is uh, at least perceived by many, perhaps in China, as being pro-China. Before I turn it over for the real uh, answer, I would just say I would certainly be delighted if Secretary Clinton wanted to go to Taiwan. <laughs> and as I started out by saying, I'm a historian, and I remember when Dwight Eisenhower, our president, went to Taiwan, and uh, I found in the records evidence that John F. Kennedy was planning to go to Taiwan. So it would not be totally unprecedented for a very high-level American official to go, but I guess I would doubt it. <laughs> the answer to Nancy's question is, um, your question to Nancy, is, um, would be directly related to how you could answer the question you asked me. Uh, I, I agree with her, I don't think it's going to happen, it's not going to be a factor. But the, um, the PRC clearly has different views uh, within, the organ within its uh, vast uh, official and unofficial commentariat. Um, so some of the first questions I got from PRC media outlets were, isn't it time now to push ahead? 
and I was delighted to have the opportunity to respond that it definitely is not the time to push ahead, that the split of the vote in Taiwan shows you there is no clear consensus to go toward a closer political uh, alignment with the PRC or to rupture that and to, and to take risks with something new. Uh, it's, uh, the PRC needs to show additional patience and cannot expect Mr. Ma to violate his promise uh, not to address this during his next term of office. And I think it's important for uh, those people interested in Taiwan to express clearly to the PRC at every opportunity that um, rushing this will have no good outcome. Uh, and, and when I say rushing, that doesn't mean the outcome must necessarily be the PRC's outcome. It's just that it's going to take decades to uh, sort out what the people of Taiwan want to know about their future and to see what the future of China brings. Eric McVeigh in the Institute for Foreign Policy Analysis. Doug, I'm surprised you didn't mention arms sales. Uh, are you saving it for the third panel? And if so, I'm uh, trying to keep you from having to do that. Well, arms sales were on my talks, but I got a two-minute bullet fired at me, so I skipped over the arms sales portion. Obviously, there will be additional arms sales by the United States to Taiwan. What they are, when they are, those are all issues for administration uh, consideration down the road as Taiwan brings its needs to the table with the U.S. But the, um, the, the need for Taiwan to maintain an adequate defense against the still large uh, threat from the PRC ha is undiminished. I would throw two questions to China at this point. For years, Chinese have said, we cannot restrain our arms buildup opposite Taiwan because the DPP might come back. Well, they didn't. Uh, this is a testing moment. They, for years, they said we could not expand Taiwan's international space because the DPP might come back, pocket that, and then China will have lost some leverage. Well, the DPP is not coming back for a while. Uh, so it's time for China to be asked the question, what about international space and what about reducing the threat to Taiwan? John Zan with CTI TV of Taiwan. Um, the, the question is for uh, both Doug and for David. Uh, David mentioned that uh, the uh, uh, acceptance or rejection of the uh, 92 consensus uh, was only a, one of the factors uh, that impacting the uh, outcome of the elections. Uh, Doug, uh, you didn't uh, tell us uh, what, what it was that you said that, uh, you know, uh, um, aroused uh, the eyebrows of so many people. Uh, the, uh, my question is, given the, the kind of change, the kind of coming around in terms of the uh, DPP uh, position on ECFA, do you foresee a day when uh, the DPP attitude towards the 92 uh, consensus might change? Because, you know, in four years or uh, in eight years, when uh, the DPP, uh, you know, field fills another candidate, it, he or she may still have to face the 92 consensus. Uh, you know, being uh, one, one of the factors or the factor affecting the uh, election outcome, it would not be good for the DPP. So do you see a day when uh, its attitude towards the 92 consensus may come around, may change, or may soften? for both of you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Zhang's questions. I think I have in my presentation saying that the election result uh, should be interpreted in, by many, many factors. Um, 92 consensus obviously is the main uh, campaign themes of the Mars campaign. Uh, obviously, Tsai wouldn't uh, respond it directly. Uh, Tsai's campaigns on social justice, income equalities, and a domestic issue, all sort of domestic issues. So I think there's no uh, intersections between these two uh, campaigns. And that's why it's very, very difficult for us to uh, jump into the conclusion that this, this, this election is a referendum of the 1990 consensus. Uh, however, in my presentation, I also said that uh, 1990 consensus may be, may be uh, taken as a cue, you know, you know, heuristic cue by the ordinary people as a, as a stand for some stabilities across the Taiwan Strait. So I, I think the more accurate interpretation is more about the stabilities of cross-strait relations, 
rather than the 99th consensus. Whatever 99th consensus can do, as our uh, panel panelists said, that is a serve as a tool, as an instrument to facilitate cross-strait negotiation or cross-strait dialogues. It does not have any inher inherent inher inherent uh, values. Now, that's a very important di distinct di uh, distinctions. Um, DPP, of course, that uh, uh, Tsai Ing-wen said that she would like to uh, form the uh, Taiwan consensus after, uh, after her assumed office. But then, uh, through the de democratic process, anything could happen. So uh, I don't know uh, whether in the future that the DPP uh, in the future will accept or not accept the Taiwan consensus. Maybe come up with some other, some other terms. But vitally, I think it's very important that for any terms, Beijing will serve as a veto players. Even DPP come up with some terms, which maybe closely resemble the 90 consensus, but Beijing may disapprove it. Then everything falls. So, so this is the situation that I think that uh, uh, it, it, we should uh, think about, uh, as uh, Dr. said, that it is still uh, very divided in, in, in Taiwan, divisive in Taiwan. We have a 46 versus 52 percent. And on this issue, on the, on the issue toward China, it's, it's quite divisive. And uh, forming a Taiwan consensus through the uh, democratic position seems to be quite a, a good way to do so. Of course, that now KMT and the CCP already find a way to do so. so carry on based on this, this, uh, this process, based on these uh, premises. But, but I mean, uh, for the DPP, they may find the other way to get on the negotiation table. Um, the 92 consensus is a fiction, but it's been a useful fiction. It's permitted things to go forward. I think one of, in talking to people after the election in Taipei, um, I, several of my contacts um, said that there was a contradiction in Ms. Tsai's campaign. On the one hand, she wanted to replace the 92 consensus and criticized it. On the other hand, she wanted to maintain the benefits of ECFA, which could not have been achieved without the 92 consensus. And this, and because she was unable to construct a characterization of the Taiwan consensus that would practically replace the one of the 92 consensus, she was left with a, you know, a talking point too short in her campaign, in, in their view. And I tend to agree with that uh, uh, assessment, but I would leave it to the political scientists who are going to pour over the data and the, the campaigns up and downs to see whether that is true um, in fact over time. Hi, uh, Nadia Chow with the Liberty Times. Uh, I have a two questions. First one is about the, uh, you know, the dialogue with the opposition party that President Ma proposed. Uh, it sounds like too good to be true since it ha you know, never happened before. Uh, what will be the incentive for the two parties to cooperate in, you know, in the following four years? Uh, instead of you know, gain from the other party's failure, why, why they want to cooperate? And the other question is that, um, DPP might be the, you know, the most pro-U.S. party in Taiwan. They always uh, emphasize the importance with the U.S. But this time, we didn't really see, you know, DPP gave any favor from the U.S. government officially. <laughs> Even though U.S. government maintained, you know, claim to be neutral, but we saw a lot of, you know, other signs that indicated that they prefer Ma to got elected. So, uh, what do you think? You know, what went wrong with the DPP's policy? Does that mean that U.S. want to see uh, DPP be more broad, you know, to, to open up to China more and take a more aggressive, you know, uh, steps to reach out to China? Thank you. Well, um, it all depends on uh, the ruling parties and mentalities. Uh, if you think that the election is uh, winner takes all, of course, if you uh, carry the majority, you can do whatever you want in the <coughs> LOI and pass any legislations. But I think this would fall into the trap of the opposition parties because the opposition party may well be uh, hand you a rope and, and ask you to hand yourself. So I think uh, <laughs> the best way for the, DP, for the KMT is try to consult the DPP 
even though on those issues that, uh, especially on those issues that both parties have a di uh, di diverged views, I mentioned that you know nuclear power plant is the one that would be a potentially uh, divergent issues that could uh, both sides can, can sit down to debate and maybe uh, to talk. Um, but if you don't talk, of course you can carry on, and then once there's something, some accident happened, then you have to uh, take the full responsibilities. I think the uh, over the years, uh, voters are. Uh, more or less uh, the test of uh, uh, all kind of uh, party struggles uh, based on the political ideologies. Uh, I, th I personally believe that the Taiwanese voter would like to have some more, uh, you know, uh, cooperations between the parties. Show some, uh, show show the people that they can cooperate uh, for the benefit of the uh, the, 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 the common peoples. Um, what's the second question? Second. What's your sec second question? U.S. policy toward the TPP. Yeah. U.S. policy is your specialties. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. U.S. policy is your specialties. <laughs> well, um, I think the uh, during the uh, during the uh, election campaign that uh, I think the uh, um, there are a lot of rumors that uh, uh, U.S. officials seems to uh, try to use the other way to uh, influence the elections, but then officially. Uh, time after time that officially that the U.S. government come out to say that the U.S. would like to maintain the neutral stance and they would like to cooperate with the whatever uh, uh, government elected, whatever party elected as a government, duly elected as a government uh, in Taiwan. So I think, I think that there's always uh, misperceptions uh, and the perception that uh, whether the U.S. government really would like to set any fingers or influence the, the Taiwanese domestic party, but, uh, ta Taiwanese politics. But I, I sincerely believe that uh, the U.S. government probably, uh, as a fellow democracy, uh, don't want to interfere uh, with the domestic politics. Um, the, the, the Taiwan side, I think the, uh, the, the DPP would like to put more and more cautious approach toward, toward China. That's, that's understandable, because that you know that it's already, uh, we have uh, the 41% uh, of the total export go to China through Hong Kong and uh, include Hong Kong, Macau. We have, uh, last year, we have uh, 100, uh, uh, 12, 12 billions, more than 12 billion US dollars uh, investment in China on the last years, which more than 85% of our, F our FDI go to China. So I think DPP would like to promote a more cautious approach. I think KMT also have such uh, incentive to do so. Because that you know that you have a 16 agreements uh, signed between the self and the Arabs. You have a three memorandum signed between the self and the Arabs. But then b the implementation seems not to up to the uh, standards. So I think there's both party have some way to address these issues more cautiously. And uh, the worst things for the KMT, I think, for the Maoist government is that to th is to think that they have the mandate so they can push forward uh, for all kinds of policy they want with China. And uh, Doc just said that uh, that would not be the wise because that uh, for the Beijing to push forward uh, the political negotiation uh, uh, with, with Taiwan, and that that uh, that I think the is, is is very 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 bad. But I think there's another issue that probably you have to uh, to think. Uh, Say it uh, carefully. In Mao's campaign pledge, in Mao's campaign pledge, Mao said that um, he would like to uh, step by step to f to set up mutually set up the official representation official representative office in China and in Taiwan. That exchange of official representative office is quite uh, you know, a lot of symbol in there. It remind me remind me that uh, in Hong Kong, if you have the uh, you know, in Hong Kong and Macau. That would be very, very easy for China's influence to coordinate uh, within the, in Taiwan. And that would you know, consolidate uh, uh, Chinese influence in Taiwan elections. As I said, that in, uh, you probably won't, wouldn't believe that in you know, a southern part of Taiwan, uh, there are a lot of uh, business. Uh, for example, in the um, Jiayi, uh, you have the uh, orchid flowers. Uh, China would like to buy it. You have the uh, uh, sea bass. In, in Kaohsiung, uh, China would like to buy it. I think there are a lot of uh, uh, you know, penetrations and the grassroots the interactions between China and Taiwan, and that ultimately will influence the, the election result. And I, I just show you the two examples. One is the CEO, uh, another is the uh, uh, Hualien uh, uh, County Magistrate. So these sort of things that would, I think, increase Chinese influence in Taiwanese elections, not necessarily through the uh, threat, but through very, very subtle way 
uh, influence of Taiwan uh, voters' mind. Let me, let, let me respond to the first question. Uh, I think uh, we should uh, distinguish between two uh, things, uh, two levels of uh, corporations. Uh, first, I think uh, uh, the, 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 the basic step is to agree to have a platform and have dialogue toward each other. And I think uh, 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 most of our friends here remember that uh, there is a debate uh, between President Ma and uh, uh, Chairman Tsai on ECFA. So at least don't just talk to your own believers or your own supporters. You have a platform to talk to each other. And after this step, then we can talk about uh, is it possible to reach some consensus despite other disagreement. So the first thing is to have this kind of platform to talk to each other. And then there is a second level. Then we have a, a, some uh, 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 consensus despite uh, the, the disagreement. And I think uh, the President Mao is referred to this. That is, uh, he would like to have a, a platform to talk to each other and a regular ones. So uh, uh, I think this is a, a, a basic point to, to, to mention. And also another thing is that it will push uh, the two sides to cooperate actually is uh, the internal operation or internal rules inside the legislative UN. And actually, because the, legis the inside rule of the legislative UN, it's uh, very uh, consensus driven. That means, uh, the, if you know, there is a, a mechanism called uh, 政党协商 Actually, uh, if a, you have uh, uh, three members of legis in the legislative union, you, have a phone, you can form a group and actually veto any uh, uh, legislative bills you don't like and prolong it to another uh, 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 several months and until uh, the speakers who want to uh, uh, put forward uh, the frozen le the legislative the frozen legislative bills. So uh, this mechanism actually in in legislative union in the past uh, drive many cooperations between political parties. But the problem is everyone knows we need to cooperate, but no one wants to sincerely say that uh, we need to share the political cost fairly. Everyone wants to say that hey, we want to cooperate, but. They want to show, their own, show to their own supporters that we are very insistent, but re they are really behind doors. They, they want to cooperate. So it become a very strategic behavior. That is, in fact, they will be compelled to cooperate by the internal operation and internal rules of the legislative UN, but no one wants to admit it publicly. That's the, the, the situations. Okay. One final, uh, uh, Johan, you want to? No, just, uh, okay. No, I, I, I just want to clarify one point. Uh, because, uh, David uh, 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 mentioned that, uh, you know, the mod and tradition during the second term might establish the official representative office, you know, the um, you know, on both sides of Taiwan. I, I don't think that's uh, a, a, an exact, you know, correct statement. Um, I think what has been mentioned by some uh, official uh, is uh, a two-step approach. Number one, uh, some uh, semi-government uh, or government-sponsored trade association, trade promotion association, and uh, industrial association, they might be able to set up uh, liaison office, okay, uh, on each side of the street. Um, that would be the first step. And the possibility that the SEF and Arab, you know, the two semi-official uh, organization, uh, I think they might also explore that possibility. But actually, I wonder, uh, Beijing really is actually open to that idea because if you have Arab, you know, the uh, uh, office in Taipei can easily become the target of protest and demonstration. You know, it, 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 it uh, might not be, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know the, the, the most fruitful way to, for, 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 for a very smooth uh, cross relationship. Yeah. So I don't think that would happen very soon. Yeah. Okay, I've been told I can take one more, um, even though the food is getting cold back there. Yes. <laughs> Please. 
I'm Tony from Central News Agency Taiwan. And last question will be uh, for Nancy and, and Douglas. What, what do you think is the American factor is really essential for Taiwanese to make decision of their leadership, such like a visa waiver program or um, sales, even uh, Douglas commentary on the local media? Do you think really important for Taiwanese to make the decision of their leader based on American factors? Thank you. Well, the polls that were published by Zuyo Shirbao, as was mentioned earlier, uh, 10 days before the election uh, seemed to show pretty accurate results. They didn't, and it uh, doesn't appear that there was a big change between that 10, in that 10 day period. So I suggest that outside actors didn't have much effect on the outcome of the vote. Yeah, I would, I would simply add that um, the United States, I think, plays an important role in terms of um, demonstrating how a democracy uh, works well. Uh, and we've long been a model in Taiwan. And therefore, I would say uh, this should give us some incentive here um, to do a better job with bipartisanship, which is what we've just been talking about, so that we can continue uh, to be a model. Uh, in any case, I'd like to thank our panelists and uh, ask all of you to do so as well. And Bonnie's going to talk about lunch in just a moment. <laughs>